Hello, Jennifer Sharpley, freelance consultant. Uh, I'd like to thank Joachim for his comments on budget lines and line items. It was music to my ears, uh, because if you don't have budget lines and line items, how can you gauge, gauge actuals versus budget, and how can you discuss value for money? And I'd like to second observation to note that none of the speakers or the presenters mentioned audit commissions or strengthening audit commissions and actual historical data. Transparency is not just about putting your planning growth rates on a website. Transparency is also about the coverage of cons contingent liabilities, particularly the huge icebergs of public and local government pension deficits in the UK. Any other questions? Yes, gentlemen at the front. I'm um, Ball from Slamco. Right, um, we deal with various organizations um, on uh, international issues, especially budget and um, finance. Um, my worries, my worries about your book is that, um, just as the lady rightly said, right, in public finance, cuts actually is um, means um, reducing living standard. When government tend to cut, right, the perception is. They're reducing living standard of um, their people. And um, public finance, actually, when you come to look at it in this current environment, it's extremely difficult to put into context because politicians, they always look at the way they manage their budget on the basis of, I mean, public opinion, right? And um, areas which are of more or less public concern, especially like in England, here the I mean, um, social, uh, social welfare budget. In fact, when you look at the austerity right, issue here, right, George Osborne was even pelted right, in the last Olympic game. So discipline in public finance is something which is extremely difficult to achieve. Right? These things have been going on years, years in, years out. So I wonder the question really I want to ask is that in as much as you did not make mention of the audit, audit side of it, or you did not emphasize exceptional variance. You see, discipline is extremely important. Where exceptional variance do occur, then there is need for attention, right, as um, he's been talking about the transport budget, right? I mean, so I think this is an area where, for instance, once political, um, politicians observe the risk behind it, then they tend to take attention. But I don't, I wonder whether such um, issues really, really address, and um, I don't know what you feel about it. Anyone else on this round want to come in? We might give um, Marco a quick opportunity and a couple of uh, you. Okay, uh, quick opportunity to come in. I just um, and we'll, we'll go out and get one more round. I mean, something about thinking on how to make reforms palatable. Something on the sort of the back end side, the execution. I mean, audit yep. commissions and ex post came up, and your views on where traditional line item budgeting fits in this in this picture and then something probably that links to the, the flexibility versus discipline question. Yeah, uh, well, well, let, let me first, um, again, um, thanks uh, uh, the, the other panelists for, for kind of emphasizing things that of course are, that are in the book are things I believe but simply didn't have the time. Um, and James, uh, among various things, and I uh, he, he emphasized kind of flexibility. One of the things that in, in going from ex ante responsibility to ex post kind of sanctioning devices, I think the risk, the highest risk, and kind of Yoki might have hinted to that. Uh, you introduce systems that are extremely inflexible on paper uh, and they break, or countries try to put their best energy, try to get around them. So that, that's one, one, one risk. And I clearly uh, thanks Yoki for bringing the political economy aspect. I thought I had in one of the slides, I probably had in another uh, um, presentation, uh, one of the reasons reforms fail, public financial management, but always considered kind of technical. So they never raise, and this perhaps address one of the issue, how you get as a politician, your champions involved. And I try to kind of make the point as strong as I, as I can. I, I usually say there's nothing technical here. Because whatever you do in this area, as a minimum, reveal information. And that really triggers a completely different political discussion. You thought you were 
spending in certain sectors, you change your chart of accounts or your stand standards and realize that actually you are spending somewhere else. Uh, uh, so again, th th that's one of the things in which you make this more palatable uh, for those who in the end are supposed to, first of all, be convinced of the merits of the reforms and that you clearly provide your kind of political cover, which again is one of the elements that you need. It's not the only one. Sometimes we're desperate to find the champion. Well, we have many champions, all layers. And, and, and it's very much in the political nature of the game, as Joachim said, so it's between the executive and the legislature. But don't forget, as an international institution, we always work in countries where, you know, these typical democratic values are simply not there, kind of, you know. I had the pleasure of kind of preaching fiscal transparency in Saudi Arabia. It's not exactly the best place, but you find an angle even there, and it goes back to the context. Otherwise, you really, really slumping together moral, ethical values uh, with things that perhaps has nothing to do with fiscal discipline or, or called fiscal risks, uh, etc. And also, I wanted to thank Philip. It's a very, uh, very perspective. Uh, clearly, one thing I should have said of the, the Guinea in discussing innovation, we had to be selective, and we did not want to add a manual. And one of the things that I think I flagged in my presentation we kind of assume that all the budget execution uh, aspects are pretty much one of perhaps the building block, uh, treasurer single account, basic accounting reporting, and this commitment controls, etc. We did not address in the book because, first of all, we thought we had written already on this, and because perhaps naively we thought, okay, but these problems have been taken care of. As I said, crisis comes, and even advanced <laughs> countries shows that well, there wasn't really, or at least we didn't have more, there wasn't anything terribly new to say, but points taken, so we <laughs> may have to <laughs> in the next edition. Um, um, on the various other questions, very quickly, of course, we're very much aware of what CIFA has been doing, and we've been sort of discussing clearly in, in, in country context and also higher level the possibility to cooperate. Um, the point on, on budget lines, I mean, you still, I mean, again, again e even if you go to kind of program, missions, whatever, I mean, you don't lose uh, the, 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 the control, uh, uh, it just you shift the control at the end of the day. You still have to report and account for what you do o o on the line sort of items. I it just shifts the political discussion on what you're trying to achieve. But expose, you know, you, 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 you have. One of the mistakes has been done in the Netherlands and others, all of a sudden, you don't even provide information on the input side. And then there's a riot, because the political system, unfortunately, this, despite of all the emphasis and the rhetoric on missions and outcomes, etc., it works based on the input side. Is money really coming to my constituency? Are people being trained in the small little village? Am I providing that amount of jobs I promise? Am I building that many kilometers of country road, etc.? You have to, again, it goes back to the political sort of economy aspects of that. You, you have to sort of make it work. You have to satisfy all your sort of customers, so to speak. And a comment you made actually on transparency, I like that very much because it's not only about publishing. We've, I think we've gone, you know, as, as long as you publish information, you're transparent. Well, transparency is something different in my mind, but again, that can be a different, another um, conversation. Um, I'm not sure I got the point on the variance and the audit. Again, this is one of the things we don't discuss in this book, but clearly even audit has, has progressed quite a bit. Uh, um, in the last 15 years or so. So clearly, I, we've, we've shifted from extended audit function, which to my mind are a bit of a waste of time in these uh, days and age, uh, to more kind of exposed risk-based kind of audit functions. They should really look at, you go to any audit uh, institution in the world, they claim that they're doing value for money audit. It's simply not true. Okay, there's still very much the legalistic, compliance-oriented culture, which is very slowly changing. You really have to let go, leave responsibility, 
and then come back on a risk basis if indeed, as you mentioned, there are, the, there are variances that shows that in certain areas there may be problem. Could be from a financial side, could be simply from a uh, public service or, 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 or from the citizens at large because you know, basic services are not provided. So that's, that's the only comment I can offer at this point. Let me just see if there's any other comments in the room. We can fit in one or two if anyone has any burning ones. If not, I've, I have one I wanted to, to knock in. Yeah. Just yeah. One, sorry, people, yeah. from SIPFA. I just wonder if um, our friend from the Treasury has any views on, the, on this thing about transparency and revealing that you know, every 500, 500 pounds that's spent in every department is actually having any effect on real transparency. Are the armchair auditors coming out of the woodwork to, to, to do anything here? Because we, we've had this innovation and, and I you know, delete the email as soon as it comes because it says uh, DFID is spending 500 pounds on transport for somewhere. You know, what is it, what's it all about? I'll give you a moment to see if you want to <laughs> pick it up or not or pick it offline. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I mean, and, and one question, I mean, I'll give sort of Marco a final thought and then see if, if more broadly, James, you want to actually say a couple of words on actually what makes reforms politically palatable. Question, you might have a couple of thoughts and actually what the motivation behind this. But, but the, the question I had for, for Marco was that um, I think one of the things that seems to be really significant for me, given this sort of list of suggestions and the sort of themes coming through in this book about actually it's political, not technical, is that that hasn't been the thinking consistent externals about the way that the IMF approaches some of its reform programs. Often the critique is made and the undue sort of dominance of, of technical approaches. And here it's many members of your own department and your own staff writing this. So it'll be interesting reflections on how much this sort of thinking 20 years on imbues the, the dialogue and the approach within the IMF on the, on the PFN reform programmes and agendas will be. Uh, um, to your question, so maybe so a couple of thoughts in your concluding comments. But let me, let me first just um, ask James, I mean, that question you might want to just sort of touch upon, but more a couple of thoughts on this question of the, the politics of behind reforms and yeah, so motivates I th them. I, I think this is a really important one, and I completely agree with that these, you know, these reforms are about changing power relations and that the politics of public financial management is, is, is always central, which is why it's such a fascinating uh, topic, but you know, so, so complicated. Uh, I, just a couple of thoughts about kind of institutional reforms in particular and kind of how do you deliver those, uh, given that they do shift power away from elected officials. Um, I think you know, looking at UK experience, I think I would point to two things. One is credibility. I think you know, they are particularly you know, the creation of the Office of Budget Responsibility, the shifting of interest rates heading to the Bank of England, you know, these kind of big economic policy reforms. Uh, but you, know, you could look at kind of independence of uh, regulators and so on. I think a lot of it comes down to, to credibility and the value to elected officials of having credibility in a vibrant democracy. Uh, and the fact that that credibility is often generated by the creation of strong independent institutions. Now, the credibility then does to some extent hinge on the individuals that you put in charge of those. We've been very fortunate, I think, in this country and the individuals that we have had available to us to kind of run these institutions. And there's obviously a risk of that in a, you know, a thinner kind of environment. Uh, but you know, I think it has been a kind of key persuader um, the other thing I would say, though, I mean, I think it is an important thing, is that you know both the OBR and uh, Independence for Bank of England. I mean, these were things that came in on kind of day one of new governments, mm -hmm. and I think it is easier sometimes to you know for oppositions to decide that they want to give up power that they don't temporarily have, as it were, and then to act on that than you know for an entrenched government. Now, I, you know, you one could point to counterexamples, and I think, you know, uh, independence for the economic regulators was something that was enacted by governments that were in power. So it's not a kind of given, but, it, you know, in a, in a democracy where power does shift from, from party to party, there is, I think that creates more of an opportunity. And in countries where those transitions happen less often, I, I can imagine it's, it's harder and you require, you know, perhaps changes within the party or whatever to generate that, that dynamic. Um, I wanted just briefly to come back on a couple of other points, if I if I might. On armchair auditors, I mean, I think it is one of those things. I'm not a particular expert on it, but I think it does <laughs> change the incentives within the system. You know, I have to sign off some of these things, uh, and it does make you think. You know, should I be spending this 
money. I don't think that there is a kind of army of people out there analyzing these. I don't have the app on my iPad. Mm. Uh, you know, I would rather like to have it, but I don't. Uh, maybe it will <laughs> come. I mean, you know, these things often take a long time, and Marco kind of emphasized that. So I don't think one should judge on it. But I think it does affect the incentives on officials who are spending the money. So I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't mm. kind of see it as, as a failure, even if it, do, in a sense, it doesn't show lots of people coming up with exciting things that we spend our money on and shouldn't have done. You know, there certainly were some of those in the past, right? Um, and then finally, I want to pick up on this point about pension deficits, I think, you yeah. know, and liabilities. I, I think balance sheets are really important. And one of the lessons that we've learned from the financial crisis is that balance sheets are just much more important than we, than yeah. we thought they were. Uh, in fairness to the British government, we've been publishing balance sheets for a little bit before the financial crisis, yeah. and we're, we're trying to do more on that. Um, I think they, the pension liabilities do point to an interesting dimension of this. They're very large. They're not going to crystallize tomorrow. Conversely, the contingent liabilities of the financial sector crystallize overnight. Mm. Uh, and understanding the, the path over which these liabilities may crystallize is as important as understanding the size of them. And I think the approach the OBR have taken in their fiscal sustainability report of looking at it over long periods and looking at the expense over those long periods and whether that's sustainable over long periods of time. Uh, it, it is more useful in a sense of understanding the, the size of the pension payment than actually the big number which crystallizes over kind of 50 years. And yeah, you, know, you can come up with very big numbers in this very easily. You know, the reforms on pension, public service pensions, which I which I led on the official side, have saved over half a trillion pounds. It's an enormous number in the UK, but it's over 50 years. You know, it, 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 uh, so I think you've got to understand that that path. But I agree, balance sheets are incredibly important. It's, a, it's an area where things have developed a lot more, but I think we still have to think about how we integrate them into some dimensions of public finance. Thank you very much. Joachim, was there anything you wanted to, any point you want to pick up? or Just to say, I think budget reformers have to be opportunistic. So if you, you know, someone was asking, you know, how do I get my, re how do I get people to do reforms? I have no idea. You know, sometimes it's, mm. it's mm. probably some, confluence of context mm -hmm. that creates urgency and having the right people. You just have to be an opportunist. The one thing international organizations and consultants can do is to stop recommending silly reforms. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay, one just penultimate and then. Uh, okay. Just the a, a tiny, tiny point which I think is quite interesting in this context is this question of causality. I mean, one of, mm -hmm. one of the areas that we keep on wondering about here is basically whether if you are a government um, and you adopt some of these building blocks of reforms, um, which way is the causality really flowing? Does, does it mean if a government adopts a medium-term expenditure framework that it had an ex-ante prior commitment to fiscal discipline and fiscal outcomes and they would have done it anyway, they would have achieved it anyway, and maybe there was some institutional reinforcement at the margin, or is it really such that adopting this institutional feature is creating certain kinds of pre behavior that otherwise wouldn't have been there? And I think in many, many instances, we basically have no idea whatsoever. We, we really don't know. But it, it is obviously very important to understand this sort of stuff better, because if you think that these institutional reforms on their own are not going to create something out of nothing. Then, for instance, the question of whether you should be supporting all external auditors more would be, why the hell would we do that? It's not going to create any more political commitment to probity and control in public expenditures just because external auditors are marginally, marginally more favored by external advice and external technical assistance. But if you believe that by doing that and by creating or externally supporting these institutions, actually domestically other stuff is going to happen, then it should be a huge priority. But we really don't have enough knowledge and understanding and information to make these calls in the right proper kind of way. But it's not a, as, as is the flavor of the month in terms of ODI expressions, it's not a trivial question which one of the two happens to apply. Thank you. I've been abusing the, my holder's chair to keep you here for seven <laughs> minutes so far longer. Um, any final you'd like to <coughs> leave in people's minds, other than please buy the book, which I'll say on your behalf to conclude. Uh, Lisa, thank you very much again for the opportunity. Just a very quick, uh, um, I mean, you mentioned you know, 
what could be from the IMF reaction. Clearly, I mean, I think Joachim sort of summed it up pretty well, kind of stop giving kind of stupid advice to countries. <laughs> but don't, don't quote me there. You are on the record. I the should let you know this earlier on. Yeah. Oops. Okay, let me rephrase that. <laughs> let, me, let me rephrase. Uh, yeah. Clearly, this is uh, you, you write something with uh, the massive production, I don't know, 30 plus uh, contributors and three editors, and God knows how many kind of reviewers, formal and informal. Uh, you want to put ideas on the table and clearly to have some sort of debate and steer discussion. I think this is, this is the only thing you can hope for. Uh, the one thing I want to leave you it's, it's, it's the business of reforms a public financial management has become much more complicated over the last 20 years. When I started these in East Europe, there was basically us, Sigma, the OCD Sigma, and the World Bank. Now there are all, every single multilateral, every single bilateral. So the advice that you give, again, is part of the negotiations, which unfortunately has nothing to do with the country receiving the advice. <laughs> so bear that in mind. So it's become a business, first of all, has become a business much more complicated than it was. So sometimes the advice is silly, by all means, because it's driven by some top-down EC or whatever, or simply because a particular bilateral donors is willing to help as long as they can export their own reform. So you really have, it wasn't the case 15 years ago. 15 years ago, we were just free to give silly advice ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, the silly advice now is a really product of a compromise. Again, it's so, uh, and sometimes, unfortunately, at that very table, the recipient countries is simply not present. So I think the only things I want to leave you is really, in, in the end, the best we can do is try to provide help, hopefully, but again, it has to address real problems. If real problems, only the countries can actually tell you what the real problems are. Otherwise, these things simply, they don't work. So that's unfortunately the record. So again, thank you so much uh, for all your questions. Thanks for my, well, I'm still friends, I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and thank you for the hospitality. Well, let me thank Marco, James, Joachim, and Philip. That's been absolutely fascinating and insightful. Here's the volume, it's on the website, please buy it. If you don't want to read it but want to be taught about it, Joachim has it on his reading list. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope we can encourage James back again to uh, share some more insights as the UK um, progresses. But please join me in a uh, round of applause for the panellists.